we gather for worship this afternoon, let's sing praise to our God from Psalter 24. Psalter 24, the earth and the riches. Is, that is the great King, the Lord of hosts, to whom we come and approach this afternoon as we come into worship. This is a welcome to our worship service as we gather together, but more importantly, uh, together we gather with our God, and we come to meet with Him. He comes to meet with us, and we come to worship Him. This afternoon, uh, in addition to our regular order of worship, we'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper, and uh, so we'll be able to enjoy that fellowship, communion with our God, and communion with one another uh, in the unity uh, as the body of, the, of Christ. Let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship with silent prayer. Please stand and hear the Lord of glory call you to worship this afternoon. From Psalm 66, make a joyful shout to God all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Let's pray. 
Lord, our God, we adore you and praise you. We, Lord, seek to be faithful to this call uh, to all the earth to come and to worship you. Lord, you have so worked in our hearts to give us a desire to obey, to come and to worship. We, Lord, adore you. We adore you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, and the, and the eternal word who is in the beginning with God and was God, through whom all things were made, and without whom was not anything made that was made, and who in the fullness of time became flesh and dwelt among us, and showed his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We pay homage to you, our exalted Redeemer, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, confessing that you indeed are Jesus Christ, you are Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We worship you, Holy Spirit, the helper whom the Son has sent from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son, and who is sent to teach us all things and to bring all things to our remembrance who inspired holy men to write the scriptures to give us the revelation of our God. This afternoon, to you we come, our triune God. We come recognizing your power and your glory and your majesty. We come to worship you, bless our time, exalt your name among us, and feed our souls and enable our worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing hymn 193. Hymn 193, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. Please take your bulletin. We'll confess our faith this afternoon using the Shorter Catechism as we come to questions 14 and 15 um, and the, uh, the themes there for the preaching of the Word. If 
particularly as we're going to focus on question 14. Uh, but in light of the fall, which is what we considered last time we were uh, looking at the Shorter Catechism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. What was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created? The sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created was their eating the forbidden fruit. Just one note as you think of catechism and catechizing. If you uh, Catechisms are, are written when they're written well. Uh, they're written to be memorable and easy to memorize in a sense. And you notice just from question 15, the whole question is restated in the answer. And it's done with purpose and intent so that it's, a, it's easy to follow and track. And most of the shorter catechism, catechism questions are like that. So as you, uh, if you commit yourself to memorizing the catechism, it kind of is, it works very well that way. There are a few questions that don't do that and it can really throw you off. But this, in that sense, it helps you repeating the question as you give the answer and that's good catechism. Well, we come to our prayer of intercession this afternoon, and I do want to mention a couple, a few things, actually, for your prayers and, um, and care of the congregation. Um, Linda Van Meekren, the uh, skin cancer treatment grafting that needs to take place in Lunenburg is scheduled for January 5, so we're thankful that's not too far away, but pray for, continue to pray for Klaus and Linda. Um, and I would encourage you to, to reach out to them again. Linda is, is uh, as I said last week, she's this, gone through a lot this year. And they've also been uh, just with her muscular dystrophy and that she, they've been at home more. They haven't been in, she hasn't been in worship. Klaus was here this morning. Um, but that's just, all of that can really, the weight, the pressure can lead to discouragement. And so pray for Linda. And as you are able uh, to visit, uh, they're, they're open to visitors, so that's... Uh, uh, to visit or to call, send a card, have your kids draw some, do some artwork. Um, they just, they really appreciate that. They love their church family and they wish they could um, participate more in the life of the church and it's hard for them not to. So pray for our sister. Serve as you're able just to visit, a, just a time to spend with you uh, and for you to spend with them is just valuable um, and very much appreciated. Um, uh, also pray for Jake, uh, Jake Ninehouse, who um, had a wisdom tooth removed uh, this week, but it was badly infected. So pray for Jake. It's kind of not just his, it's not just an issue now. It's the infection. It's kind of made him sick, and so he's recovering. Um, and it told me to be praying for him. So pray for Jake for healing, for strength to return to work, and to return to worship with us. Um, <clears throat> this is the last item I want to mention is... Um, I've mentioned this to, to some of you. We, we prayed with this at a prayer meeting, but uh, our neighbor across the way um, has died. Um, Bernard, uh, Bernard Hale, he passed away a couple weeks ago. I just found out on Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, I saw a lot of vehicles there. It seemed very unusual. And they went across the road and talked with, it turned out his brother-in-law. But he had, he had died. It was actually, he died uh, a week, two weeks ago tomorrow. Um, and the funeral was last, last Monday. Um, but uh, it, it's, he, had, he had cancer. They're, they're just, I'm not going to get all the details, but there's just some very tragic circumstances. And um, some of us have known him. Some of us have been able to witness to him. The last time I talked with Bernard was inviting him to the outdoor service. But it's, it's just a, it, was, uh, it, it was just it was shocking in a way. And, and I know a lot of people know him. He's kind of somebody who's kind of a bit of a fixture in the community. I think his, that's the family home. Been there for a long time. But pray for his family. Um, I watched the funeral, and it was very sad and very gospelless. Um, and so pray, pray for his family. I, I offered any way I could support. It was after the funeral when, by the time I found out. But anyway, um, but there have just been some other interactions. But just pray for, for his family um, and, um, and for our ability to minister to our community, witness to our community, and to persevere even when we witness and... Uh, and it doesn't seem to have an effect uh, of salvation. So pray for that situation and, 
and uh, for our perseverance as a church. Um, with those items, let's come before our God this afternoon and let's pray. Lord our God, this morning we came into worship declaring how we must worship you as our creator, preserver, and benefactor, one who, who we are, uh, upon whom we are completely dependent. And we come this afternoon to acknowledge that dependence, even as we seek your face, to, know, to acknowledge that we need you in all things, and to rejoice because you are a God who cares for us in all things. So, Lord, we seek you as our creator, preserver, and benefactor as we come in our prayer of intercession this afternoon. You, O God, have made us, and not we ourselves. Therefore, we are not our own, but we are yours, your people, and the sheep of your pasture. Let us, Lord, and enable us and bring us to worship and bow down and kneel before you, our maker. Lord, you are the one who formed our bodies, and they are fearfully and wonderfully made and intricately woven. Your eyes saw our unformed substance, and in your book that were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for us when as yet there were none of them. You have clothed us with skin and flesh. You have knit us together with bones and sinews. You have granted us life and steadfast love, and your care has preserved our spirits. In you, O oh God, we live and move and have our being, for we are your offspring. <clears throat> we thank you that from when you made us to this very moment, you have cared for us. You have loved us. You have helped us. You have taken care of your needy creation, your needy creatures. We praise and thank you for it. That in our own lives, we have known your care. In our own lives, each and every day, are a countless number of things that you do for us, and so many that we just assume will happen. Bring us to remember that nothing just happens. Everything comes from your hand. And we praise you for your care for us this past week. And we pray, Lord, that as as uh, your servants that we would go forth and show your care and your love to the world around us, that we would minister to others even as <clears throat> you've ministered to us and equipped us to care. Give us a heart of love for you and for others around us, that we would earnestly care for other people. We pray within our church family for love and care for one another, for a willingness to ask the hard questions, a willingness to ask any questions, and a willingness to listen to the answers. Lord, and help us to show a willingness that others would be willing to share with us and to ask for help, ask for prayer, ask for, uh, ask, ask for uh, a hand in some way. Lord, we pray for our sister Linda. We, uh, Lord, grieve with her and some of the challenges and struggles she's faced, particularly in this past year, the loss of her daughter. We, Lord... Uh, at times we face challenges, and, and yet, uh, Lord, they, they often are spread out. But here, Lord, with our sister this past year, they seem to come one after the other. We thank you for her steadfast spirit. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for her cheerfulness with which, Lord, she comes to church and, and uh, with, when she greets people, and we thank you for it. But we know, Lord, that there is a weight and a burden, and we pray that we would bear her burden with her that we would care for her and for Kloss as they bear these things together, that we would be with them, that they would know our love and our care. Help us to show that love and care, to set ourselves aside and to, to give to them in whatever way we are able to help and provide. Help us to step out of our own comfort zones to do that if necessary. We pray, Lord, of thanksgiving for this appointment coming up in January. We pray uh, that it would remain that way and not be delayed. And we pray for your help as she anticipates this. We pray that it would be successful. It would remove uh, the cancerous portions of the skin, that she would be uh, given a, a clean bill of health in this area. And we pray for her, Lord, as it will be a painful uh, procedure and recovery. We pray for strength for her. We pray for our brother Jake. We thank you for uh, that he found out about this, uh, the infected wisdom tooth. We thank you that he was able to get removed. And so, Lord, that the source of the infection could be stopped. <clears throat> we pray that you would heal him and continue to heal him, give him the rest that he needs, give him, Lord, not to fret or worry about other things that have to be set aside while he recovers. We pray that you would strengthen him, and, and Lord, he knows the power of prayer, and he knows his need for prayer, and we, we thank you that we have the privilege of praying for him. And so we pray for healing. Bless the medications that he may have to take 
deal with the infection and give a healing. Pray that the infection would not uh, would not linger on. We pray for strength for him and that he would soon be able to return to his usual activities, to his work, to worship, and uh, Lord and and uh, other enjoyments that he has. Lord, we pray for uh, our community that we as a church would be a witness to our community. We would persevere and press on, even, Lord, when sadly, uh, Lord, our witness is rejected by many. Lord, help us to persevere and press on, recognizing we do not witness to satisfy our own selves, but, Lord, to do, to be faithful to Jesus Christ, who calls us to share the gospel, spread the word, and also, Lord, with a hope that you indeed will bring in your people, you bring in your elect, and you will use the weak means of human witness to do so much of that work. We do pray that you would bless our witness in this community. We pray, Lord, for the family of Bernard Hale. Lord, we are saddened by his death. We are saddened, Lord, by by the the destructiveness of sin and seeing it in any death. And we think particularly of him this afternoon. We pray for his family, for his sister and his other brother. Uh, We pray for his uh, other family and the many people in the community that knew him, those who were friends with him. We pray, Lord, for opportunities to witness to them, to share the gospel with them. They're going to take a long time to clean up that property and to to dispose of, of his earthly goods. Lord, we pray that you would provide opportunities to witness, to share the gospel, to invite to worship. Soften their hearts. Show them, Lord, that death is not something to be easily dismissed, to be lightly talked about, or to be laughed off. But, Lord, it is a serious thing. It is not the end, but the beginning of eternity. And we pray that you would be merciful to them and use us to be persistent in our witness. We pray that with family and friends, others, Lord, uh, in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods, in our own families, with whom we want to share the gospel, perhaps with whom we share the gospel that has been rejected time and time again, who have perhaps promised to, to read the scriptures or come to worship or other things, but don't do it. We pray, give us, Lord, to persist in dependence on you, trusting in you. And Lord, in, 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 if there's not opportunity for anything else, Lord, that we would be praying earnestly for their salvation. And we, Lord, pray that you would use us for the salvation of many. Lord, we pray for our presbytery. We pray for Dr. Frank Kovacs, and we thank you for his teaching in the Toronto area. We pray that you would bless him and his family. Bless the, uh, the labors of his teaching, that he would be faithful to Jesus Christ, proclaiming and, and declaring the truth of the word and teaching, Lord, uh, in, in the different uh, studies in the, the uh, New Testament books that he teaches that do so with, a, with a, a confidence in the authority of Scripture, the inspiration of the word of God, and that he would be a wonderful influence on the various students from different backgrounds that come through into, through his classes. We pray that you would bless his labors and strengthen him as a member of our presbytery as well. We pray as well for the DeVries family, for Kathy and Rudy. It's our adopted family. Thank you for the privilege we have to serve them in this year. We pray for Rudy as he's able to again get back into into prisons to do Bible studies and to teach and to have one-on-one visits. And we pray that even with with all the ups and downs of, of, of COVID restrictions, that these things would be maintained and continue on. And we thank you that many of the contacts he had in prison uh, before COVID, that he was able to maintain them, and even now still able to visit and know many of the the um, the inmates. That uh, many of them that still need his care and support. We thank you for his care for those in the prison, those who are being reintegrated into society, those Lord who face the struggles and the temptations to return to old lives of sin. May they remain steadfast to Jesus Christ and bless Rudy in that labor and work. Bless their home and family. Bless Rudy and Kathy in their marriage. Bless them as they train and raise their daughters in the fear of the Lord. We pray for their son, Lord, who who, uh, needs your grace and to be returned to the faith. We pray that you would be at work in his heart and bless, uh, bless his parents as they seek to minister to Jonathan. Lord, we ask that you would be with us now as we come to the reading and preaching of your word and then to the Lord's Supper. We pray, Lord, that as we consider the definition of sin, that we would be clear in what it is, but also that we, would be, that we would see your amazing love in providing a Savior to deliver us from it. Prepare us, Lord, for the Lord's Supper, that we would come hungry and expecting to be filled. Lord, we lay all this before you. We look with expectation to our God now 
to hear, to answer, and to continue to bless our worship. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing praise uh, as we prepare for the reading and preaching of God's word. Psalter 32a. Psalter 32a. What blessedness. in God's word to 1 John 3, actually 1 John 2. We'll read 1 John 2, beginning at verse 28 to chapter 3, verse 9. The word of God will be preached from verses 4 to 6. 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you, take, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. When we define words, uh, define terms, they're often very culturally defined. 
you can say something, you can have a conversation with somebody in the same culture as you, and, and be speaking of words and, and be thinking of the same definition when someone else from a different cultural background might come in, might know the technical definition of the words, but not really understand your conversation. If you came in this afternoon and I said to you, what's up? I wouldn't expect you to look at the ceiling and wonder what is literally above your head. You're, th you're thinking, what's going on? What's going on in my life? What's, what's happening in my life? And if you said to me, well, not a whole lot is, is up, actually, because I just got axed from my job, you're not, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking, oh, wow, somebody took an axe to you and came at you and attacked you. I'm thinking you got fired, you got let go. And, and in these terms, if somebody comes in, they know the definition of axe. They know the definition of up but they don't understand your conversation. We need to know the definitions, how terms are used, how they're defined in a culture. And that applies not just to local culture, Nova Scotian culture, or national culture, but it applies to church culture as well. We use a lot of terms in the church that need to be well-defined. We need to understand their definitions. We need to help those who aren't in the church culture to define them as well. The terms that we use... Uh, to describe our theology need to be, of course, biblically defined. They're not just random terms. Ooh, the terms that we use, the culture uses terms like justification. The church culture uses terms like conversion. And in the context, in different contexts, those, those terms mean different things. And in the church, they need to be biblically defined. We need to speak clearly. And we need clear definitions in order to speak clearly and accurately. And to understand, perhaps, when someone's using a term incorrectly or has changed the meaning of a term uh, away from a biblical meaning. Sometimes it's very difficult. Certain authors uh, can be very dangerous to read because they use the same terms you're familiar with, but they actually have tweaked the meaning. They've, they've adjusted the meaning. We need to understand the definitions of the terms we use in the church. And one such term we're going to come to this afternoon is sin. Now, sin is a term that's used in the culture frequently. And the culture has defined sin in various ways. Sin is sometimes used to just refer to something that's pleasurable. It tastes so good, it's sinful. Sometimes sin is, is used simply, is used to refer to uh, some, some sort of sexual thing and, and, and is often used in terms of bringing laughter and, and joking around, minimizing the issue. Sometimes sin is used to just describe something that's offensive to man. As no, God's not really in the picture. But, but because you offended me, that was a sin. You sinned against me. The culture, others define sin simply as a weakness, uh, a psychological defect, uh, a mistake that you make. All of these definitions, all they do, they, they, they minimize uh, the reality of sin. Every person does what is right in his own eyes and redefines the word sin to understand. So they have a definition of what's good and what's evil. And it's their definition, not God's definition. How do you define sin? We use it. We pray about it. We talk about it. We hear about it. But how do you define it? How would you define the term sin? This afternoon, we're going to define the term. We're going to hear God's definition. We're going to ponder what sin actually is, what it means. As the Shorter Catechism, the themes of the Shorter Catechism move from Adam and Eve sinning against God that we considered last time from Genesis 3, moving then to the next question. As you're working through the logic of the Shorter Catechism, well, they sinned against God. What is sin? It's a logical question for the Catechism to ask. What is sin? So we're going to define sin. Rather, God is going to define sin. God is the creator, and thus God gets to define the terms used by his creatures. He defines sin, and he does so through the inspiration of the Apostle John, who speaks to us here in 1 John 3. 1 John is a book <clears throat> that John wrote to, to uh, believers, to, his little, to the little children, as he so affectionately calls them, those who are under siege from false teachers who are seeking to lead them astray and to teach them a different, different definitions of Christianity than the true definitions. John writes to them 
they were under attack and confused. And John writes to them, as you work through the, the epistle, first epistle of John, he gives them various marks of what the true Christian actually is. How the, and marks by which you and I can examine our lives and, and see our own faithfulness to Christ. There are false teachers, and then in the context of sin, who are, who are, te- who are telling them, who are minimizing sin, minimizing the sinfulness of sin, and we're minimizing the need for the believer to have sin out of their lives. So we're going to do, as we come to this definition of sin, John speaks very bluntly and clearly. We're going to consider it's evil. We're going to consider, consider it's the cost of sin. And finally, it's incompatibility with the Christian life. John here presents the problem, but he also presents the solution, bringing us to Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, the one who takes away sin. So we're going to consider these these verses, verses 4 to 6 from 1 John 3. Every sin you commit is a horrific act of rebellion against God, requires Christ's work to take it away, and is not compatible with a life committed to Christ. Every sin you commit is a horrific act of rebellion against God, requires Christ's work to take it away, and is not compatible with a life committed to Christ. First, we're going to consider that the first statement. Sin is a horrific act of rebellion against God. John says in verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And then he simply equates the two. Sin is lawlessness. That is, is a big equal sign. Sin equals lawlessness. He defines sin and leaves people without excuse. It's just clear. It's laid out. It's not a big complicated definition. It's simple and clear. Sin is lawlessness. Whoever commits sin, every single person who has committed any sin, who does any sin, is is under this definition. They are committing lawlessness. Now, the the word for sin, the Greek word for sin, is, um, and perhaps you've read this before uh, in devotionals or or, or elsewhere, the Greek word for sin literally comes from from a term that means missing the mark. It's like you took a shot at a bullseye with a bow and arrow, and, and you missed it. You missed the mark that you were aiming at. I think this perhaps maybe, I don't know if it's directly related or at least perhaps to help us understand that, you you know, we often pray or hear others pray for forgiveness for our sins and our shortcomings. Shortcomings in a way of missing the mark. You you shot the arrow and it fell, you know, 50 feet short of the target. You, 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 this is, you, you fell short of the mark. And so when John comes and he says, sin is lawlessness, he said you're aiming at something and you fell short of that mark of hitting and, and, and keeping the law in your thoughts, in your words, and in your deeds. And in fact, it's actually worse than that. Because when we sin, we make a conscious choice, not just that we missed it by a millimeter, but we are actually just either, we're either not even aiming at that target altogether, or we're focused on another target. We're trying to hit another mark. We're seeking our own pleasure, our own happiness. We're seeking whatever we wanted. We're not even interested in the target God has set before us, uh, set the mark of, of God's law. Now, as John speaks here, sin is lawlessness. As he defines it this way, he really is saying three things, three things. First, the implication of this, and what he's teaching us is there is a law. There is a law. There is a target you've got to be aiming at. There's a standard that you need to meet. There is a right and there is a wrong. You can't be accused of being lawless if there's no law. I'm talking with the children. Uh, recently, I don't, know what we were, I don't know if we were talking about, I think we were talking about getting arrested. They tend to like to play cops and robbers. But uh, we, uh, we had this conversation. I said, you know, uh, there has to be a reason to get arrested. There has to be, you have to have broken a law in order to face the consequences. Now, leaving aside the fact that society doesn't, not every law is just, but, but there has to be a reason. You don't, people, you know, don't typically, in a, in a just society, aren't afraid of just suddenly having the door kicked in and being arrested for absolutely no reason and being thrown in jail. That does happen, but it's not just, and it's not right. You can't be accused of being lawless if there's no law 
uh, if, there's, if there's no standard to know when you're breaking it or not breaking it. And the truth of that is not just in our society, it's the truth of God. This is why uh, Paul writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, verse 15, where there is no law, there is no transgression. If God had never given us his law, he could not be just in saying, now I'm going to hold you accountable. But God has given us his law. He's written it on our heart when he's made us, and he's given it to us clearly in the word. There is a law. There is a target that we are to hit. The second thing John says, beyond the fact that there's a law, is that there's a lawgiver. The law didn't just pop up out of nowhere. And it's not what you think the law should be. It's not what I think the law should be. It's not what our society voted on to determine what a law to be or what our parliament has decided ultimately. That is not the ultimate law. God is supreme, not parliament. There is a lawgiver. It is not man, but it is God. It is the creator who can set the standard for the creation. And God does so rooted in his character. It's rooted in his character. We don't have to worry that God is capricious, that one day it's going to be this law and tomorrow it's going to be that law. Today murder is evil and tomorrow it's okay. And, and today, uh, you know, it's, it's bad to be greedy, but tomorrow go ahead and hoard whatever you want. God doesn't change. His moral character doesn't change. His moral statutes don't change. There is a lawgiver who is good and holy and righteous and just, and he is the one who gives the law. And our obedience is not so much to the law as it is to the lawgiver. Our concern is not so much that we kept uh, a standard, that, but that we honor, respect, and serve the one who gave the standard. It's more important to obey him. And this is a humbling reality. Because you and I want to change the law. We want to tweak it. We want to soften it. We want to make it a little more palatable for the flesh. We want to make it a little better so that we can, we can, um, we can, we, we can skirt around it, get around it. We want control. It's humbling to say, there's a standard, and it's not me who sets the standard. So there's a standard. There's a law. There's a lawgiver. And three... Those who break the law are guilty of lawlessness. That's what John's teaching us. He's saying there's a law, it's given by a lawgiver, and when you break that, you are guilty of lawlessness. And that is the core of sin. That's the essence of sin, lawlessness. You are making a choice to disregard the law and the lawgiver. You're acting in, in rebellion. You are committing treason against the lawgiver, against God himself, who gives that law. Anarchy is the absence of government. If you want anarchy, you want there to be no government and, and no, no one set over society. And since Adam and Eve determined to side with Satan in the Garden of Eden, they have, that was a choice for anarchy, to get themselves out from under the authority of God to be their own authority to have no government over them, but to be the government of themselves, to have anarchy, resisted the rule of God. It was a direct attack on the authority of God. And everything you and I do that is against the law of God is a direct attack on his authority. God has a right to demand of us what he will, and we have no right to say no to him, but yet we do, and we want to. Charles Spurgeon notes that the evil of sin is not first the consequences of sin, but the fact that it is treason against God. The evil of sin is not its consequences, but it's who we commit the sin against. This is why scripture is so emphatic in speaking to the horrors of sin and the sinner. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan Thomas Goodwin writes, he says it is called poison, and sinners are called serpents. Sin is called a vomit, and sinners dogs who return to it. It is the stench of graves. Sin is called the stench of graves, and sinners are called rotten sepulchers or rotten graves. It is a mire. Sinners are called pigs. 
Sin is called darkness, blindness, shame, nakedness, folly, madness, death. Whatever is filthy, defective, infective, painful. The scriptures have many, many terms are very descriptive in getting to the horrors of sin. And yet the worst name they could give sin is sin. Paul in Romans 7 verse 13 as he speaks to the to the reality of sin and as a believer the struggle against the remaining corruption in the flesh he said sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment as he understood the law as he came to understand the law might become exceedingly sinful sinfully sinful is literally what what Paul is getting and he repeats the word for sin that sin would become the, 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 the worst Paul could speak of sin is that it's sin. It's evil. It's sinfully sin. Speaking to the, 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 the sinfulness of sin. God has created you and me responsible. And he's given us a good law. He's also created us reasonable to understand that law, to know that law, to understand what he requires of us. And he gives us a good law. But you and I, when we sin, we choose to break it. We say, no, we want our own way. Whether we commit sins of commission or commission which is when we look at God's law and we say uh uh-uh, uh I'm going to do it differently you tell me not to lie I'm going to I'm telling a lie I don't care what your law says or whether it's sins of omission where we ignore the commands of God where we don't do what he commands of us he says love me above all and my neighbors ourselves and we just don't bother about our neighbor we don't think about our neighbor they don't have an interest in in doing that we omit what he has told us to do this is what our shorter catechism gets at when it speaks of, 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 of sin as a, a want of conformity unto. That's not doing what he's commanded of, of us and a transgression of the law of God. We go directly against him. Both of these are sin. Both of them are attacks on God's authority over us. It's all defiance. Both as the shorter catechism defines it and as we come to that, that see its scriptural basis here in John. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Every sin you commit is a horrific act of rebellion against God. It requires Christ's work to take it away and is not compatible with a life committed to Jesus Christ. We've considered the definition of sin. Sin is lawlessness, a rebellion, a treasonous rebellion against God. Well, we can consider the evil of sin also by its effects, and particularly by the extremely high cost to take it away, the high cost of removing sin. And so we'll come to our second point, verse 5. Sin requires Christ's work to take it away. And you know that he, that is Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Thomas Watson uh, wrote on uh, wrote a, a works on and sermons on the shorter catechism and and on this uh, this uh, question fourteen he he speaks about sin he says we need to consider the greatness of sin the evil of sin by four things first we consider sin is evil by its source it comes from straight from hell it comes from Satan he is the one who has infected the world with sin and tempting our first parents. Second, the greatness of sin is evident by its nature, what it does. It defiles all who touch it. It is a disease that infects all who have it. Sin is absolutely irrational. It's not just evil, it's foolish. It makes no sense to continue on in sin. It it is... Sin is a hard taskmaster. You are a slave... If you, if you are enslaved to, enslaved to sin, it's not a joy. It's, a, it's, 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 it's irrational. It's completely irrational. It abuses you. It also abuses God's mercy that God has created you and given you so much good. Just as we saw in the Garden of Eden, they had all the trees of the garden. God said, don't eat of this one. They had, God had, had set them up for success and they abused his mercy. And it grieves the Spirit of God when you and I as believers of Jesus Christ, sin. Consider the greatness of sin by its source and by its nature, but also by its effects. 
Sin degrades our honor. What has sin done? We are created to be vice regents of God. We are created to be his, his rulers over the earth under his authority. Instead, we become slaves to sin. We become slaves to the evil one. Instead of having authority over creation, we capitulated to creation, and now we are in hard bondage and as the creation groans because of sin. Sin, the effects of sin, they take away our peace. They give us no joy that takes away our peace. Watson notes that you know, Judas, was, his conscience was so plagued by guilt, he lacked in peace, he hung himself to try to find peace. And the sad reality is, it did him no good. It only made it worse. Sin, the effects of sin, of course, is that it leads to all evil. All evil in this world are a result, all, is a result of sin. Every evil thing. Every evil in your heart, every evil in your family, every evil, e everything evil in our society comes as a result of sin. Including death and damnation. But the greatness of sin is most evident in the cost it took to remove sin. The fact that it took nothing short of the death of the Son of God to remove sin. That his sacrifice was the only sacrifice that was sufficient to remove sin. That, that, that as we saw last week and in, in last couple weeks in Leviticus 16, that, that it, 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 was, it was insufficient for the blood of animals to, to be that detergent to remove sins. We needed the blood of Christ to remove sin. Only he can remove defilement. Only Christ can touch the unclean and make it clean instead of becoming defiled by it. Only Jesus Christ, because of his own work, can actually say, you are forgiven. Your sins are taken away because he has earned that for you. You can't say that to someone in your own strength. You can say it, but it will mean nothing. But Jesus Christ says it, and it means everything. We needed propitiation. We needed the wrath of God, the just and holy wrath of God, to be satisfied because he has been offended by sin. And Christ came to turn, him, turn his wrath away. He took it on himself. This is why Christ came. He was manifested. He appeared. He came into this world to take away our sins. Verse 8, he came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil. Chapter 4, verse 9, Jesus Christ came into the world and this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him that we would no longer be under bondage to sin and in slavery but we would live free lives that can be lived to the glory of God free of sin this is why Jesus Christ came to be the scapegoat that we saw last week take away our sins to have the sins, our sins placed on him and to be taken away as far as the east is from the west so far as God removed our sins from us. In Isaiah 53, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> verse 5, we're given that well-known description of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. When we read he was wounded for our transgressions, in the Greek translation of this, it is literally he was wounded for our lawlessness. He was wounded for our lawlessness. He was wounded because we sinned, because we've been lawless. And as we come and we consider what our Savior has done, that he was manifested in the world to take away our sins, it's a time for us to humble ourselves, but also to celebrate, to give thanks, and to worship our God. This is, this is what we're able to do as we come to the Lord's Supper in a short while, that to, to remember what he has done to come to die for our lawlessness, to take away our sin, that God is no longer going to hold us and say, you need to pay the penalty for your lawlessness, because Jesus Christ has done it for us. He was the perfect sacrifice for us. John goes on to say, he, in him there is no sin. He's the perfect sacrifice. As, as we, we considered, uh, as we looked and spent time from Leviticus 16 and, and going back into Hebrews, those wonderful words of Hebrews 7, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests 
to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. He was the perfect sacrifice. We can't offer ourselves for our own sins, never mind the sins of the person sitting next to you. But he died perfect, holy, pure, undefiled, the perfect sacrifice, the sinless lamb of God. We can't, but he could and he did and he frees us. Brothers and sisters, consider the cost of your salvation. What it costs to take away your lawless deeds and take away your sin. Ponder the love of the Lord that he would send his son, that Jesus Christ would come. Consider the great consequence also of every of, of sin. Every sin that you and I commit should shame us and bring us uh, grief for despising such a sacrifice. But at the same time, it should also bring us back to him. Bring us back to him for forgiveness for that sin and for purity, for a hatred of lawlessness and for a love of the law and a desire to serve him faithfully. Come back again. He doesn't, dis- he doesn't remove us. He doesn't, he doesn't pull away from us. As we approach the Lord's Supper this afternoon, we need to remember the cost of our salvation. Remember the reason for the breaking of Christ's body and the shedding of his blood. And brothers and sisters, to remember that the price, the cost has been paid. That he has indeed paid the cost to take away our sin. Every sin you commit is a horrific act of rebellion against God. It requires Christ's work to take it away. Finally, it is not compatible with a life committed to Christ. John writes in verse 6, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. This is actually a further point, building on what what John says at the end of verse 5, that in Christ there is no sin. John here continues to build on that idea that there's that, that, of the sinlessness of Christ. Not only that it made him the perfect sacrifice, but his own example needs to be the one we follow. That in Jesus Christ, there was he, he resisted all temptation. He resisted all sin. And so you and I, following after our Savior, need to resist all sin, all temptation in our own life. We need to resist every desire to be lawless. Christ opposed sin, and so if you are abiding in him, you also need to oppose sin. To abide in Christ is to believe in Christ. It's to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's to know his cleansing power, to have been given the Holy Spirit, to enable your walk of faithfulness. Christ has always been sinless. He is sinless, and he always will be sinless. And so we must strive to be as our Savior was, to put away, to to resist evil, and to to put away by grace all of our sin. These false teachers were were telling the people that it wasn't that big of a deal, that they, they could still be in Christ and still be in sin. They could abide in both, abide in Christ and abide in sinfulness. And I'm sure they weren't encouraging sinfulness, but it wasn't that big of a deal. And John is emphatic as he comes here. He said, whoever abides in him does not sin. We need to spend a moment to consider what that means. Some have taken this, and uh, I think wrongly taken this to say that the Christian can reach perfection in this life, that the Christian is perfect. And some are, are, are proud enough to say that I've reached this level. I haven't sinned in however many years or months, fooling themselves. From the context here, John is not saying the Christian is perfect. John in in, uh, in 1 John, in in chapter 1, in the earlier in the letter, he's speaking to believers, he's speaking to the same believers. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, my little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John recognizes that there is still sin in the Christian life. And not just the context of his letter tells us that, but the context, the whole of Scripture tells us that. But the fact that John mentions, speaks about sin, and points these people to the advocate, to Jesus Christ, should they sin, 
tells us that John also recognizes that the believer still does sin. There is no contradiction in John's letter. He doesn't change his writing. We also know this from the grammar. And, and the fact of this is that the language, the, the, the verb of, 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 of doing, he does not sin, is in the present tense. It's an ongoing pattern. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing action. He does not sin. He is not sinning. And so the, I think the ESV gets this right uh, in that when it says that, that whoever abides in him does not keep on sinning. It is no longer a pattern of his life. It is no longer the habit of his life. It is no longer, if you are in Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus Christ, sin is no longer the pattern of your life. It cannot be the pattern of your life. Christians, we still have remaining corruption in us. Paul writing as a believer in Romans 7 struggles against this. He, he talks about the, 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 the frustrations and continuing to deal with sin in him. That the good that he would do, he doesn't. And the evil that he would not, that he does. And he, he cries out, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he rejoices in the salvation of Jesus Christ to continue to remove from him the corruption that yet remains. You and I as believers do at times sin. That's, not, that, that's a fact. That's not an excuse. But we are no longer controlled by sin. We are no longer under sin's power. It is no longer to be the norm of our life or the pattern of our life. Rather, verse 3, all those who hope in Christ purifies himself just as he is pure. That's the pattern. Of, that's the pattern our life, our life ought to have. Or in verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices, right there in that, he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. That's the pattern of the Christian life. That's the pattern you and I ought to have. Not sin, not lawlessness, not rebellion, but righteousness, purity, striving. If you hate sin, thank God for your new nature, that he has given you that hatred for sin because that's not the natural state if you despise sin rather than loving it and wanting it and clinging to it or desiring after it, if you despise sin, thank the Lamb of God for taking away your sin. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you despise sin, thank the Lamb of God for taking away your sin and enabling your abiding presence, his, enabling your abiding in him and him in you. If you understand this rightly, Whoever abides in him does not continue sinning, does not make the practice of sinning, does not habitually sin, then you don't need to despair every time you commit a sin that somehow you're no longer a Christian. You have an advocate with the Father, John says. So whoever sins has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Knowing that you still have sin remaining in your life is not, to keep you, is, is not something to keep you from coming to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not for sinless people. But it's for those abiding in Christ who hate sin and know their need and come to Christ for strength. That the Holy Spirit, even as the physical elements strengthen your body, the Holy Spirit strengthens your soul to continue to press on in that fight against sin in your life. But if you profess faith in Jesus Christ and continue to practice sin, if that is the pattern of your life, there is a warning that you cannot avoid. A warning from John, whoever sins, whoever habitually sins, whoever continues this practice of sinning has neither seen him nor known him. It's a warning that your profession is a sham. You can't abide in Christ and abide in sin. It is not just a change of, 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 of your state. It is a change of your nature, the Holy Spirit coming and transforms your very nature when you come to believe in Jesus Christ. To see God or to see Christ or to know Christ are equivalent to the terms to believe on Christ. One writer puts it, anyone who expects to stand in confidence and to be like Jesus Christ when he returns must deliberately and vigorously reject sin. For not to do so reveals a heart that rejects God's authority. When you, 
realize the seriousness of John's words, and he comes with a serious and clear warning. As you hear this, and perhaps you struggle to hear that, perhaps it brings great conviction on your soul. Don't despair. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't say, well, I guess it's all over for me. The problem isn't with the word. The problem isn't that the Holy Spirit is coming to convict you. The problem is with the sin and the guilt in your heart, and that needs to be addressed. If God is, is, is convicting you of sin, but he's giving you that hatred for sin, you want to fight this sin, you want to be it put out of your life, then give thanks for your changed nature and come to Jesus Christ for strength. Even if you struggle and you say, I do, is this a pattern of sin in my life? And it, and it bothers you and, it, and it, you need to come to Jesus Christ. Get strength from Jesus Christ. Don't give up. But come back to Christ. Come to him again. He's not, he's not cast you off. But if you're giving in to sin, if, you're, if this is the pattern of your life and your heart is cold and your heart is hard and this is, this is what your life is and looks like, hear this warning. Come to Jesus Christ as well. It's the same place you need to find yourself. In the Lamb of God is salvation. He alone can change your heart. Whether you're you're backslidden and acting like an unbeliever, or you're actually an unbeliever, you need to come to the same place for the same solution, to come to Jesus Christ, to confess your sin, to give thanks, and to plead with him for a life abiding in him. This is not a call for, for, for this uh, looking inward and trying to, trying to parcel out. Does this sin mean I'm an unbeliever? Or does this sin mean I'm, I'm just backslidden? You don't need to be in either place. You need to come to Christ for walking where it's not, uh, ooh, I, I'm rocking on the line. It's to say I need Christ in either state to be right, to be flourishing in the Christian life, not just getting by and squeaking, squeaking by. Receive the conviction and flee to Christ. Every sin you commit as a horrific act of rebellion against God. It requires Christ's work to take it away. Brothers and sisters, it is not compatible with life in Christ, with a life committed to Christ. To commit sin is not compatible with a life committed to Christ. This afternoon, we've considered the sinfulness of sin, the horror of rebellion, the need for Christ, and the grace that he offers so you can abide in him and break the pattern of sin in your life. Thank God for this definition. Thank God that he has come to us so clearly to give us his standard, to speak to us. We're not left wondering. We're not left in some unjust limbo. Is this right? Is this wrong? God has given us his standard. And thank God for sending Jesus Christ, because only in Jesus Christ is it possible for you to hit the mark. Only in Jesus Christ. Can you, can you take a shot only in Jesus Christ we want to shoot at the target God has set and then to hit the mark, to keep the law, to do and act faithfully. As you understand sin and its definition, you're able to better understand how you ought to live. And you're better to be able to share it with others and to point them to Jesus Christ and to say, you need him. You need him. Understand Jesus came for this reason to take away our sins, to, to, to get rid of the works of the, to destroy the works of the devil and to give us life. May this help us now as we approach the Lord's Supper with a reminder of our need, but also the willingness and the ability of Jesus Christ to strengthen us, to satisfy the need, and to increase our faithfulness to him. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you have not been unclear with us both about the reality and the nature of sin and also the reality of the solution that you yourself have provided, your son coming to suffer, to die the accursed death on the cross to take away our sin. Lord, However this passage has hit home tonight in our hearts, we pray may we all come to Jesus, receive his grace, and know his presence in our lives. May we be abiding in him before we leave this place.
Now as we approach the Lord's Supper, O Lord, as even oh, as we feel the conviction of sin, we pray that none who are truly in Christ would be kept away, that we would, we would feed upon Christ, be strengthened in our faith, and, th and thankful for a Lord who loves us so much, knows our weakness, and provides for us. So bless us as we approach your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Let's sing hymn 93. Hymn 93 from Psalm 103. The tender love a father has. Brothers and sisters, your Lord invites you to come and to dine with him here at the Lord's Supper. He knows you struggle with sin. He knows your weakness, your doubts, your fears, and your struggle with assurance. And he invites you to come. It doesn't take too much self-examination to see these things in yourself as well, the struggles and the doubts. But if you know your need, if you hate sin, and want to grow in holiness, you're not only invited to come, but you need to come to dine with Christ. Christ gave you this meal to remind you of his saving work to take away your sin. And he comes to feed your soul by faith with himself, providing you bread and wine as a symbol of his body and blood. And as you eat, feeding your soul by his Holy Spirit with spiritual food and drink, enabling your ongoing fight against sin, strengthening you to press on and resist. This is a meal for faithful believers in Jesus Christ whose life reflects the Christian faith. All who are abiding in Christ are invited to come, including if you're not a member of this particular local church, but are a member in a Bible-believing evangelical church. The supper is weighty and requires earnest participation, lest you bring on yourself the judgment of God. Don't participate if you don't know what it means. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you practice sin without repentance or a desire for holiness, or if you're not a member and cared for in Christ's church, now is the time for you to remain here with us, but to seek Christ and ask for grace to be able to obey his commands and enjoy his benefits. That's true for all of us as we approach the table, to seek Christ, to seek his face, to ask for his grace, to enjoy the benefits that he gives us in the Lord's Supper. So let us bow our heads and ask him to prepare our hearts and to consecrate this meal. Lord our God, we approach you again in prayer. And we thank you for this meal. We thank you that we can come and approach before you and, and come to this table that which you set for us to be blessed, to be fed, to be nourished. 
We pray that we would better and better understand the benefits, that we would better and, and better receive the supper, and that you would strengthen our faith where there's unbelief, that you would encourage us where we're discouraged by sin, that you would remind us of our need for you. And just as it would be foolish when we're hungry or when our bodies are weak to ignore a meal or to reject food for the body, so, Lord, now when we're hungry, you know our need, and we feel the weakness of our, of our souls, be foolish to reject this good meal that you've given to feed us, to strengthen us spiritually. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for coming. Well, Father, as you through him have supplied our every need, we pray for the grace to receive him well and to be strengthened in our covenant relationship with him. We pray for the Holy Spirit to feed our souls with Christ, even as we feed on him. And we pray that you would then take this bread and the fruit of the vine, which in accordance and to your institution and command, we set apart to this holy use. We pray that you would sanctify them, bless them, that they may be sacramentally the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That we, even as we participate in these things, would look to, to the heavenly realities to which they point, to our Savior at the right hand of, the, of our God mediating for us. Through these things, increase our faith. And strengthen us as a whole congregation together. Grow us in unity love and service towards others in the body of Christ even as we rest in our head. We pray that you'd bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now ask those who are serving to come forward. and eat. Remember that Jesus Christ died for you. Feed upon him with faith.
gives it to you and me, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, that is, for the putting away of sin. Lord our God, we thank you for this meal, for its simplicity, and yet its profound nature. We thank you that we can come together as your people to enjoy this meal together, but more than that, to dine with you, to receive your blessing, to be encouraged as we meditate upon your sacrifice, and to know that in these things your Holy Spirit comes to work, to strengthen our faith. You have condescended, Lord, through simple signs to teach us wonderful truths and to minister to us as human beings. We thank you for such grace and love. We thank you for communion with you, Lord Jesus, and we pray that we would only grow in that communion and fellowship, that relationship with you, and that through the, the days and weeks ahead that you continue to strengthen our faith and build us up in you, that this meal and this whole service of worship and this whole day of worship would be used by you to strengthen us, to equip us, to guard our hearts, to resist sin, and to live holy, law-abiding lives. We pray, Lord, that as we have partaken of this, these holy things, that we would not want anything to do with that which defiles or makes unholy and impure. We pray that even as you have reaffirmed your covenant love for us, that we too would live in covenant faithfulness with you. We would, we would faithfully abide in you, keep your commandments. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for calling us your friends. And may we be a faithful friend to you. And so we pray that you would edify us, continue to strengthen us. We pray this in the great and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God. Hymn 159, O Savior, Precious Savior, again we'll sing verses 1 to 3, and then verse 4 is our doxology. Hymn 159.
Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and every way. The Lord be with you all. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.